Hey guys, today I'll show you a crime thriller TV series named Breaking Bad Season 2. Spoilers ahead, watch out and take care. Previously on Season 1, high school teacher Walter and his business partner Jesse scheduled a transaction with the notorious drug lord Tuco, but during the deal, an unexpected incident occurred. To their horror, Tuco savagely beat one of his underlings to death in front of them, sending them a clear warning. The future dealings with Tuco were obviously not going to be smooth sailing. As Walter and Jesse prepared to leave, Walter did some calculations in the car. He figured out that he needed a large sum of money to cover his children's college tuition, the mortgage, and all foreseeable expenses for the next 10 years. With their current earnings of $70,000 a week, they would reach their goal if they continued trading with Tuco for another 11 weeks. Jesse, still shocked from the bloody scene, was in a daze. Just as they had driven away, Tuco returned, blocking Walter's path. It turned out that the underling hadn't died but was only unconscious. Tuco wanted Walter to save him. Despite being a chemistry genius, Walter was no doctor, but under his intimidating presence, he attempted CPR on the underling. Tuco then forced Jesse to give the underling mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. Before Jesse could proceed, the underling was gone to meet Satan. The failed attempt angered Tuco, who vented his frustration by kicking the body and then ordered his henchmen to bury it. Afterward, Tuco signaled for Walter and Jesse to leave immediately. As a witness to this murder, Walter was left feeling uneasy. Back at home, Walter stood in front of the TV, trying to calm his complex emotions. He was so preoccupied that he didn't even notice his wife, Skylar, standing behind him. When Skylar was preparing food in the kitchen, perhaps to relieve the pressure, Walter attempted to initiate some smelly intimacy with her to cool off. This time, however, Skylar did not feel happy. Instead, she felt like Walter was using her as an outlet for his frustration. After his failed attempt, Walter went outside to cool down. Skylar later found him and expressed her understanding of the difficult time he was going through with his treatment, but made it clear that taking his frustrations out on her was unacceptable. After the heart-pounding transaction with Tuco, Jesse has been terrified. To bolster his courage, he even purchased a handgun for self-defense. The next day, he met with Walter and told him about the harassing phone calls he's been receiving lately, and a car, suspected to be Tuco's, lurking near his home. Jesse suspects that Tuco wants to kill him to silence him and intends to shoot Tuco during their next deal, believing that the best defense is a good offense. However, Jesse's plan is clearly too naive. He's a rookie when it comes to guns, and even if he did manage to shoot Tuco, what about Tuco's henchmen? The two of them, one sick and the other a coward, are hardly a match for them. To truly kill Tuco, they would need a well-thought-out plan. Due to a previous theft incident, the relationship between Skylar and her sister, Marie, has been unpleasant. Skylar has been ignoring her for a long time. To ease the tension, Marie took the initiative to call and leave a message inviting Skylar to dinner, but she never admitted her mistake, nor did she apologize for the last incident. Marie's husband, DEA agent Hank, knew about her kleptomania and even arranged for her to see a psychologist, but the headstrong Marie made all kinds of excuses to avoid going. She even intentionally ran over a neighbor boy's toy car with her vehicle. Seeing that Marie and Skylar had yet to reconcile, Hank was in an awkward position. So he visited Walter's house, hoping Skylar could forgive Marie just this once. Hank's plea for her thoughtless sister made Skylar's repressed emotions finally erupt. She was heavily pregnant, and Walter disappearing now and then was already too much for her to bear. Seeing Skylar distressed, Hank didn't know how to comfort her using his muscles and could only offer her a consoling hug. Later, at the police station, Hank saw surveillance footage from the night Walter and Jesse stole the methylamine. Judging from their technique, Hank knew they were not amateurs, but their clumsy actions suggested they were not habitual criminals, possibly drug dealers driven to theft out of desperation. That evening, Walter drove home and found a suspicious black sedan. Recalling what Jesse said, he became highly tense. The next day, Skylar woke up to find Walter not in bed. In reality, he hadn't slept at all, but had been standing by the window all night, watching for any signs of danger, fearing Tuco might harm his family. Of course, Walter wouldn't tell Skylar the truth and claimed he had a stomach ache and couldn't sleep. Skylar didn't suspect anything, and when she returned to the bedroom, Walter hid the knife he had stashed on the couch, clearly ready to fight Tuco to the death if necessary. After a night fraught with anxiety, Walter finally resolved to eliminate the looming threat of Tuco. 
Jesse was in full support, claiming proficiency with firearms and suggesting that if Walter also armed himself, their chances of success would double. But Walter produced a bag of nondescript beans that, despite their ordinary appearance, could effortlessly dispatch a person unseen. These were castor beans, from which the lethal toxin ricin could be extracted. Only a minuscule dose was needed to kill a person, and its detection during an autopsy was notoriously difficult. In theory, the plan was sound. Now, the weapon for the deed was ready. The remaining challenge was how to administer the poison to Tuco undetected. They got straight to work in Jesse's basement, extracting the toxin. Walter had the perfect idea for administering the poison, mixing it into the meth for their next deal with Tuco, who had a habit of personally testing the product. Once he tasted it, the plan would be complete. Just then, Agent Hank called from the crime scene he'd just cleared up, informing Walter about Skyler's emotional breakdown earlier. He noted that Skyler had been under a lot of pressure lately, compounded by the sensitivities that come with pregnancy. Hank hoped Walter could spend more time with Skyler. As they talked, Hank mentioned the bodies he'd found at the crime scene and sent photos to Walter. The sight shocked Walter. He recognized both bodies. One was a gang member killed by Tuco, and the other was the burly man responsible for disposing of the body. Walter realized Tuco had begun targeting the witnesses from that day, sparing not even his own men, let alone him and Jesse. They could end up in a dire situation. It was a point of no return. Walter urged Jesse to flee and hurried back home, retrieving money hidden in a vent. He packed the cash and a handgun into a cardboard box, presumably to prepare for a quick escape with his family. Walter was anxious upon discovering Jesse wasn't at home, only to be relieved when Skyler mentioned their son was at a friend's house. Skyler was oblivious to Walter's inner turmoil. However, reality was not as grim as Walter feared. It turns out the burly man hadn't been killed by Tuco. He had died from an accidental blood loss while disposing of the gang member's body. Walter's strange behavior soon aroused his wife's suspicions. Faced with her questioning, he struggled to explain. At that moment, Jesse called. Walter looked out the window to see Jesse's car parked downstairs. Last time Jesse had come over unannounced, he was thoroughly scolded, and they had agreed that to avoid Skyler's detection, Jesse must never show up at his house uninvited. Seeing Jesse's unusual actions, Walter rushed downstairs, confronting Jesse about his nighttime appearance. However, Jesse was too frightened to speak. It was Tuco who had forced him, brandishing a gun and threatening Walter to get into the car. Fearing for his family's safety, Walter dared not resist and complied. At the DEA office, Agent Hank put up pictures of Tuco on the wall. Just last night, they had found Tuco's fingerprints at a deserted parking lot and launched a capture operation. His henchmen were nabbed, but Tuco managed to slip through their fingers. Based on past cases, Hank figured Tuco would probably make a run for Mexico. After rallying his team, Hank hurried over to Walter's, already clued in on his disappearance. He checked Walter's car before going inside but didn't turn up any leads. At this point, the cops were taking statements from Skyler and her son, collecting basic details like Walter's height and what he looked like. Skyler remembered the last things that happened before Walter went missing, especially a phone call, which we know came from Jesse. But that number wasn't in Walter's call history. Connecting the dots, Hank realized Walter must have another cell. To keep Skyler from worrying, he didn't share this bit of info. While the cops were on the case, Skyler and her son did what they could, printing and putting up missing person posters everywhere. Marie lent a hand sometimes, reassuring Skyler that the police would definitely find Walter. As they started getting on better terms, Marie wanted to clear the air about the gift theft, but Skyler was too overwhelmed to entertain that conversation. On Walter and Jesse's end, Tuco had taken them to a spot near the U.S.-Mexico border and locked them in a hot trunk, nearly making them pass out. Maybe from sheer exhaustion, when the trunk popped open, Walter hallucinated seeing his wife, who had learned the whole truth and had forgiven him. It showed that Walter's real burden wasn't the cancer, but the secret of cooking drugs behind his family's back. Hank's speculation was right. Tuco was indeed aiming for Mexico, and he really wanted Walter for his dope cooking expertise. Having Walter with him meant he could make a comeback in Mexico. Jesse became disposable after Walter was found. Tuco was ready to eliminate him, but Walter stepped in and saved his life. In the chaos of his escape, Tuco was oblivious to the fact that the burly man was already dead. After two days without a trace of him and his lair taken down by the drug squad, Tuco suspected a betrayal. Both Walter and Jesse had no desire to accompany Tuco to Mexico. Their only escape was to use the poison. If they could just get Tuco to consume the meth laced with ricin, they'd be in the clear. But fate had it that the more Jesse wanted Tuco to use that particular batch, the more Tuco chose a different one. 
At Walter's house, Marie's blabbering revealed that Walter had a second phone, which made Skylar uneasy. She suspected Walter was seeing another woman on the side. But considering what everyone knows about Walter, the chances seemed slim. Marie mentioned that Walter had previously said he bought some drug from Jesse. Perhaps this matter was related to him. Hank went to investigate at Jesse's home. As soon as they heard it was someone from the DEA, Jesse's mother became cautious, terrified of misspeaking. Despite Hank's questioning, he didn't manage to obtain any useful leads. However, he unexpectedly confirmed the model of Jesse's car. With the car's model, they could use the GPS system to track it. At the border, Tuco was busy cooking, while Walter and Jesse were watching Daniel's CC movie in the room, accompanied by an old man in a wheelchair. He was Tuco's uncle, who was paralyzed and unable to speak, only able to communicate by ringing a bell on his wheelchair. Walter couldn't help but grumble about the foiled plan, complaining that Jesse had talked a lot but failed to get Tuco to consume the poisonous meth. Right then, a news report on the TV caught their attention. It was about the burly man and the henchman. Frightened, they quickly changed the channel. At the moment, Tuco suspected the burly man had betrayed him and worried that if he found out the burly man was already dead, he might lose control. If that happened, Walter and Jesse would be in trouble. Walter and Jesse thought the old man had dementia because once when Walter tested him, he got no response. They didn't take him seriously, even discussing their poisoning plans in front of him. When Tuco wasn't looking, they even mixed the poisonous meth into the food. As Tuco was about to eat, his uncle suddenly rang his bell, startling Walter and Jesse. It turned out the old man wasn't as unwise as he appeared. His mind was actually clear. Initially, Tuco didn't understand his uncle's intention, thinking he wanted to swap food. However, when the bell didn't stop ringing, the uncle even used all his chicken strength to knock the food onto the floor, which infuriated Tuco. But he quickly noticed that his uncle kept staring at Walter and Jesse and began to sense that something was off. He started asking his uncle to ring the bell if he didn't like these two men, and the bell rang. When Tuco asked if Walter and Jesse were plotting something, the uncle rang the bell again. That's when Tuco finally understood that Walter and Jesse were up to no good. Jesse was the unlucky one, dragged outside by Tuco and severely beaten. Walter rushed out to help, but Tuco always had a gun in his hand and Walter had no idea how to rescue Jesse. Pressed by Tuco for answers, Jesse was terrified and dared not say anything, worried that Tuco might lose control and kill someone. Walter had no choice but to confess everything, admitting they wanted to poison him. Hearing this, Tuco glared menacingly at Walter. At that moment, Jesse picked up a stone and hit Tuco with it, and the two wrestled their muscles. In the struggle, Jesse managed to grab the gun from Tuco and fired a shot at him. Following the gunshot, they kicked Tuco into a sand pit. Tuco wasn't dead, he was just lying there, howling like a goose in pain. The most straightforward action would have been to fire another shot to finish him off, but neither Walter nor Jesse had the courage to do so. Jesse had fired the gun out of self-defense, and now, when it came to actually shooting someone to kill, he simply couldn't bring himself to do it. In the end, they left Tuco to his fate in the pit and prepared to flee in their car. Just as they were about to make their escape, a cloud of dust appeared on the road in the distance. A car was speeding towards their location. Walter thought it might be Tuco's cousin. Tuco had previously contacted this person to help a few people cross the U.S.-Mexico border into Mexican territory. Fearing discovery, they quickly got out of their car and hid. Unexpectedly, Tuco managed to crawl out of the sand pit and staggered over to Jesse's car. Meanwhile, the approaching vehicle had arrived at the house. It wasn't Tuco's cousin, but Agent Hank, who had found the location using the car's anti-theft GPS system. He hadn't found Jesse, but instead came across the fugitive Tuco, who recognized Hank immediately. Gunshots rang out as both men took cover behind their vehicles and exchanged fire rather than kisses. Tuco had a machine gun, while Hank only had a handgun. However, Hank outsmarted Tuco and soon had him out of ammunition. Seizing his chance, Hank shot Tuco dead as shit. Walter and Jesse, who had witnessed everything from their hiding place, were scared to even breathe. When Walter realized that Hank was the one who had arrived, he took Jesse and fled the scene. Although Hank was known for his bravado and was not modest about his abilities, his victory over Tuco proved his competence. If Walter wanted to continue in the drug-making business, Hank would always be an unavoidable presence. It was hard to imagine what would happen if Hank discovered Walter's involvement in drug production and who would come out on top. With Tuco dead, the immediate crisis was averted. However, Walter's sudden disappearance, combined with the revelation of his second phone, was exposed. It remained to be seen how he would explain this to his wife. It seemed likely that this could cause yet another conflict between them. Walter and Jesse took the opportunity of the gunfight to escape. 
They walked to the road and then went their separate ways. Walter managed to hitch a ride with a passing car. As for his disappearance, he seemed to have already thought of an explanation for his family. Walter didn't go straight home. Instead, he ended up at a supermarket. To everyone's shock, he appeared there completely naked. The supermarket staff, startled by the sight, rushed him to the hospital. Upon hearing the news, Skylar and her son came to see him. Walter feigned ignorance, claiming he couldn't remember anything that happened during his missing days. Such an explanation seems plausible since Walter was a cancer patient in a grave condition. Besides, seeing Walter safe and sound brought his wife and son to tears. At the police station, Hank was debriefing the details of Tuco's demise. He explained that he was following a lead to find Jesse and unexpectedly encountered Tuco, resulting in him shooting Tuco in self-defense. Meanwhile, Jesse, aware that the police would investigate him, returned to his place. The first thing he did was to dispose of anything related to drug production. His RV, along with various drug-making tools, was taken away for safekeeping by the cousin of Jesse's close friend, Badger. Then Jesse had Badger make an anonymous call to the DEA, tipping them off with the intention of leading them to his arrest while ensuring they didn't discover his drug-making operation. It wasn't long before an armed DEA team burst into the hotel where Jesse was with a prostitute. Both were promptly arrested. Hank took on the interrogation of Jesse, who denied knowing Tuco when asked. As for his car being at the border, he claimed it had been stolen not long ago and had no idea how it got there. However, Jesse was heartbroken to learn that the police had found drug money in his car. He could only tearfully deny that the money was his. At the same time, Jesse insisted he had been with the prostitute in the hotel for the past three days, never stepping out. Although he strenuously denied everything, Hank wasn't convinced and decided to question the prostitute. Fortunately, Jesse had already aligned their stories, so Hank came away empty-handed after much effort. That was Jesse's plan to save himself, and so far, it was going smoothly. But Hank wasn't one to give up easily. To Jesse's surprise, Hank brought in an important witness for another round of questioning, Tuco's uncle. Jesse thought he was done for, but the old man didn't play by the rules. When Hank asked if Jesse had been at the crime scene, the old man didn't ring the bell. Instead, he urinated on the spot, pissing them off. Despite hating Jesse, the old man was less willing to cooperate with the police. And so, Jesse had a stroke of luck. Due to insufficient evidence, the police had to release him. Walking out of the police station penniless, Jesse managed to borrow the prostitute's phone to call his father, hoping to stay back home for a while, but he was rejected. A previous betrayal by his brother had already caused a rift with his family. With no other options, Jesse had to settle for staying at a local bakery on the street corner. On the other side, Walter managed to hoodwink his wife and son by feigning amnesia. However, the doctors proved to be a tougher crowd. As soon as they heard about Walter's memory loss, they wanted to conduct a mental assessment, concerned that it might be a serious brain issue. Although Walter was resistant, he had to play along with his performance and comply obediently. From the psychiatrist, Walter learned that the treatment could last anywhere from a few days to several months, and he was not allowed to leave the hospital until he was cleared. This panicked Walter, as it would seriously delay his money-making schemes. Later, Walter inquired about doctor-patient confidentiality. The doctor assured him that the content of their conversations would not be disclosed to a third party without the patient's consent. Once this was confirmed, Walter confessed that he hadn't lost his memory at all. He had pretended to do so because the pressure was simply too much, and he wanted to disappear for a while to relax. He lied because he was worried about how to explain it to his family. Initially, the doctor was skeptical of Walter's story, but started to find it reasonable upon learning about his experiences. That evening, Jesse got in touch with Walter and learned that he would be discharged the following day. Walter's main concern was when they could resume their drug-making activities. Despite many setbacks, Walter's determination to make money through drug production remained steadfast. Jesse, on the other hand, couldn't stop complaining about the drug money that Hank had seized, leaving him in dire straits. After hanging up the phone, Walter began to calculate his cash flow and suddenly realized a serious problem. When he had initially planned to flee with his wife and child, he had hidden a stack of cash and a handgun in a cardboard box and stowed it in a ventilation duct. Having been away from home for so long, he had no idea if it was still there or if it had been thrown away as trash, which would have been a significant loss. Anxious about this, Walter sneaked into his own house that night. Fortunately, the items were still in the box, so he re-hid them in the ventilation duct. Through the crack in the door, he saw his wife and son and felt a sense of guilt. 
After getting everything done, he returned to the hospital, reinserted the IV into his hand, and pretended as if nothing had happened. The next day, Hank and Skyler came to the hospital to pick up Walter. The always flamboyant Hank did not forget to boast about his heroic deed of shooting the drug lord Tuco, and even kept Tuco's teeth as a trophy. Walter could not bear to look and averted his eyes. Being able to return home excited Walter. In an effort to foster intimacy with Skyler that night, he even played the naked man. However, Skyler was not amused. She questioned him about a second mobile phone. Faced with her inquiry, he didn't know how to respond and tried to play the amnesia card again. But this time, Skyler did not believe his bullshit. Perhaps she also had doubts about his disappearance story, but she decided not to press the issue, thinking it was due to his immense stress. However, the fact that he had secretly hidden a phone was undeniable. Walter's old excuses would no longer work, and Skyler was clearly disappointed. She turned off the light and went to sleep with her back to Walter, signaling that a family crisis was brewing. Walter was left wondering how he could possibly make it up to his wife. The following evening, Walter covertly met with Jesse at a supermarket. Aware of his financial struggles, he handed him some money. Just then, a police officer entered the store, cutting their conversation short. Walter informed Jesse that there had been some trouble at home and that he needed a few days to resolve family issues. They agreed to cease contact during this period. In an effort to mend his relationship with his wife, Walter unexpectedly prepared breakfast the next morning to the surprise of his wife and son. He also attempted to engage his son in conversation but had little success. Once the son left for school, Walter broached the subject of the cell phone incident, claiming that the noise Skyler heard on the night of his disappearance was not a phone call, but an alarm he had set as a medication reminder. Skyler wasn't fooled. She found the explanation insincere and upset, left the house without her phone, and drove away. While she was out, Walter took the initiative to repair the garage door, hoping to appease Skyler. However, she returned with the same stern expression, clearly giving him the silent treatment. In front of his son, Walter went to great lengths to present himself as the perfect father, only to discover that his son had secretly changed his name among his classmates, which was quite disheartening for Walter. Meanwhile, Jesse's past few days were equally distressing. Drug enforcement officers had not found anything related to drugs at Jesse's house previously, but unbeknownst to him, his mother had secretly visited Jesse's basement after Hank had found her, where all the evidence had yet to be cleared. Not only did she witness everything, but she also took photos. Realizing their son was beyond help, they decided to reclaim the house and demanded Jesse leave within three days. Jesse didn't take his mother's threat seriously, assuming it was just said in anger. However, three days later, he was still in bed when his mother came knocking. It was then he realized the gravity of the situation. Jesse pleaded with his mother for another chance, vowing to reform himself, but she was unwavering and refused any negotiations. As they argued, workers began removing his possessions. Despite his protests, nothing changed the outcome. Before she left, his mother demanded that he leave the keys to the front door and the garage, showing no mercy. Jesse was at his wit's end and had to call Walter for help. However, Walter's home was in such disarray that he was in no mood to deal with Jesse's problems. In front of his wife, Walter had to control his anger, so he pretended to take a survey call and hung up quickly. But Jesse was desperate and called Walter again, claiming he was homeless and asking for more money. An angry Walter refused, warned Jesse not to call for a while, then hung up again. When Jesse called a third time, Walter outright rejected the call. Seizing the moment while Skyler was out, he slammed down the phone in frustration. Infuriated by Walter's callousness, Jesse had no choice but to drag his luggage and ride his second-hand Tesla motorcycle to a friend's place. Initially, the friend was willing to let Jesse stay for a few days, but the friend's wife was hesitant, worried about the bad influence on their child, so Jesse had to leave in embarrassment. On the street, he called a bunch of Fairweather friends for help, but no one was willing to assist. In his despair, he remembered the RV that Badger's cousin had towed away, thinking it would be fine to spend the night there. Under the cover of night, Jesse sneaked into the trailer park. After finally climbing over the large gate, he fell into a portable toilet with blue liquid splashing everywhere. Jesse turned into a smelly, soaked mess, too miserable to even stand his own stench. He managed to get into the RV, put on a gas mask, and lay down like a pig. Reflecting on the day's events, he was close to crocodile tears. The next morning, Badger's cousin noticed a trail of blue footprints and initially thought a thief had invaded the factory, only to discover Jesse in the vehicle. The man informed him that the RV was fixed, and including the cost of fixing the toilet, Jesse owed $2,000. But Jesse couldn't come up with any money. The man told him that if he didn't pay, he would sell the RV and everything on it to settle the debt. 
Jesse and Walter relied on that vehicle to make money. It couldn't be sold. Jesse begged for a two-day extension, promising to find the money. However, the man didn't believe him, and after kicking him out of the trailer park, he immediately contacted a potential buyer. Seeing this, Jesse snuck back in secretly and simply drove the RV away. By the time the man realized, it was too late to chase him down. Walter has been feeling suffocated by the eerie atmosphere at home lately. After his son leaves for school, he goes to have a heart-to-heart -heart talk with Skylar. He admits that since falling ill, he has done many things that hurt his family. He confesses to not being a good husband or fulfilling his duties as a good father. However, he assures his wife that no matter what happens, his love for them will never change. Walter strongly denies having an affair and hopes that Skylar will stop giving him the cold shoulder as it only serves to drive them further apart. Skylar remains troubled by the fact that Walter owes her a reasonable explanation. She is hung up on why he secretly has a second phone. Unless he can clarify this, they can't move past the issue. As his wife presses him, Walter knows that whether he reveals the truth or continues to hide it, their relationship has suffered irreparable damage. Skylar decides to end the conversation and drives away alone. At that moment, Walter notices a familiar vehicle parked nearby, the RV used for drug production. Approaching it, he sees Jesse hiding inside behind the drawn curtains. Walter is disgusted. Jesse, knowing he's in the wrong for being there, nonetheless concocts an excuse. He claims that Hank has taken all his money, and as Walter is his in-law, he must take responsibility for him. Already filled with pent-up anger, Jesse now becomes Walter's punching bag. Walter unleashes a verbal tirade, calling Jesse a fool. He points out that he has been the one producing drugs all this time, while Jesse has been nothing but trouble. In short, Walter crushes Jesse's pride underfoot. The humiliated Jesse can't take it anymore and explodes, resulting in a fight between them in the vehicle. As Walter is already sick, he is no match for Jesse and finds himself on the ground. Jesse wants to punch Walter hard but ultimately holds back. After calming down, Walter takes Jesse back home, not only giving him half of the money he has saved, but also asks if he's hungry and offers to make him breakfast. Meanwhile, Skylar emerged from a convenience store next to a gas station. It turns out she went to buy cigarettes. Once back in the car, she lights one up immediately. The woman driver beside her gestures for her not to smoke, but Skylar continues regardless, seemingly unconcerned about her pregnancy. The silent treatment with Walter is obviously putting great pressure on her. The scene shifts to Walter going to the hospital for chemotherapy, but this time, Skylar doesn't accompany him. Watching other patients being cared for by their relatives, Walter is suffering. When the specialist asks how his relationship with his wife is, he puts on a brave face and claims everything is fine. The only consolation is that after the first round of chemotherapy, Walter's condition has improved. The next round of treatment is scheduled for two months later, around the time Skylar is due to give birth. The long bill at payment time indicates it's going to be expensive, and Walter's face is bitter with the cost. The cashier can't help but give him a sympathetic look. It's only when Walter gets back home that he discovers the hospital has sent a bill for his stay during his feigned amnesia. It's 13000 for just three days. Walter pretends to agree to accept financial help from the businessman, Elliot, but he would rather produce drugs than accept aid from his old classmate. After counting the money he's hidden away, which is already half given to Jesse, plus the medical expenses, he is nearly back to square one. With Skylar's delivery approaching, Walter must find a way to make money quickly. Elsewhere, Hank reports to his superior at the DEA. Since Tuco's death, the drug market has been relatively quiet. However, a figure known as Heisenberg has caught Hank's attention. Thanks to his achievements in drug enforcement, Hank has the opportunity for a promotion and a pay raise. He's also been assigned by his superior to a joint mission on the U.S.-Mexico border. Drug trafficking is rampant there. It's a bona fide danger zone. A promotion is certainly exciting, but what no one knows is that Hank, while appearing tough, isn't as strong as he seems. He suffers a panic attack in the elevator, but to maintain his image, he tries hard to act normal. Hank's psychological trauma dates back to the last gunfight with Tuco, when he was alone with just a handgun against the drug lord armed with a machine gun. Although he's been promoted, it also means dealing with even more vicious drug lords. Hank is no superhero. Flesh and blood can only take so much. The day after his promotion, Hank takes a day off to brew beer in his garage, trying to enjoy life. While packaging the bottles, he accidentally cuts his hand. In the middle of the night, he's startled awake by what sounds like gunshots. Thinking an enemy has come for revenge, he's terrified. Upon checking, he discovers it's just the beer he was brewing, which exploded due to improper sealing. Although it was a false alarm, it reflects Hank's deep-seated fears of his family getting caught in the crossfire. 
Early the next morning, Hank throws away what he once considered a trophy of war, Tuco's grill into the river. After all, every time he sees it, he's reminded of its former owner and the immense psychological pressure it brings. After getting paid by Walter, Jesse drives his RV back to the trailer park. Even as a drug dealer, he's a man of his word, returning to settle his debts. Besides that, he buys a second-hand little car from Badger's cousin. With transportation sorted, next on his list is finding a place to live. Jesse quickly locates a rental. The property manager, Jane, owns the house. Initially, the sexy Jane asks Jesse for proof of income, which he doesn't have as a drug dealer. Luckily, after spinning a tale of woe, Jesse persuades Jane to rent him the house. An added bonus is that Jane lives right next door, which provides him with a great opportunity to peep at her. With his living situation resolved, Jesse meets with Walter to cook meth in the wilderness once again. But they're faced with a new problem. With Tuco gone, they can't sell their product in bulk. Walter sees only two options, either find another big-time drug lord like Tuco to partner with or have Jesse sell the meth in small quantities himself. To Walter's surprise, Jesse chooses neither and instead suggests he become Tuco himself. After years in the game, Jesse is confident he can build his own sales network. More importantly, this would allow him and Walter to stay off the front lines and make money safely. Initially, Walter doesn't support Jesse's plan, reluctant to trust strangers. But Jesse is determined, insisting on becoming a drug lord in his own right. He even threatens to end their partnership if Walter doesn't agree. In the end, Walter concedes. Soon, Jesse's old friends, Skinny Pete, Badger, and Combo, arrive at his place. They are now the key parts of the new sales network. Each of them will be given one ounce of meth to sell for 2,500. They'll keep 500 as their cut and pass 2,000 back to Jesse. As night falls, Jesse's three partners weave through the city corners, selling meth to addicts from all walks of life. By day, Jesse hides the meth in secret spots for his partners to pick up. Everything's running smoothly. Jesse makes a tidy profit without getting his hands dirty, but trouble is never far away. One night, Skinny Pete is dealing with a female addict when he walks into a trap. The woman screams that the cops are coming, and in the chaos, Pete ends up running into a stairwell only to find the woman's husband has been lying in wait. The couple robs Pete of all the meth he has left. Before long, Walter and Jesse met on the outskirts. Actually, Walter didn't really believe Jesse could pull it off, but he ended up being proven wrong. Jesse handed him a bag filled to the brim with cash. However, Walter quickly noticed a problem. By his calculations, there should have been an additional 1,000. Faced with Walter's skepticism, Jesse revealed that Skinny Pete had run into trouble and been robbed. But Jesse remained composed, considering the loss as an inevitable part of doing business. Walter wasn't buying this business rationale, though. He wasn't concerned about the missing 1,000 per se. His worry was about the reputation. If they let themselves be robbed without retaliation, word would get around to other addicts. Imagine what would happen then. Everyone would think they could get away with it. If Tuco had faced such an incident, he would have dealt with it. If they wanted to carve out their own territory, being soft wasn't an option. However, Jesse failed to grasp Walter's intent, thinking he was just upset about the money. So Jesse handed over an extra 1,000, which only infuriated Walter, who threw the money back at him. The next day, Walter found Jesse and handed him a handgun, indicating they couldn't let the robbers off so easily. From Skinny Pete, Jesse got the address of the drug-addicted couple, so he decided to settle the score. After psyching himself up, he arrived at the couple's front door. When no one answered his knocks, Jesse climbed through a window. The house was in complete disarray, and the addict couple was not home, leaving behind only their dirty little boy, who clearly had been neglected. The child wasn't phased by Jesse's presence and continued to watch Daniel C.C. movie on TV, oblivious to the stranger. Jesse attempted to change the channel out of kindness, only to find there was just one channel available. Jesse tried to coax information about the couple's whereabouts from the boy, but to no avail. Soon, the boy told Jesse he was hungry, and just like that, Jesse's attempt to conduct serious business turned into an impromptu babysitting gig. He found himself cooking a nice meal and playing hide-and-seek with the child. Just then, there was a commotion outside. The addict couple had finally returned. Jesse quickly took the child and hid him away in a room. As the couple entered the house, they started arguing about something. Taking them by surprise, Jesse knocked the husband down, wary of the gun he might be holding. With no choice, the couple surrendered meekly. As a drug dealer, Jesse knew they wouldn't have squandered all their meth so quickly. He forced the pair to hand over what was left, only to find there wasn't much remaining. It turned out the woman had lost a portion of the meth, which was the root of their argument. 
The man informed Jesse that even though the meth was gone, they still had cash. He led Jesse to the yard where, to Jesse's astonishment, they had stolen an ATM machine. To ease Jesse's concerns, the man assured him that they had stolen the ATM from beside a convenience store, and no one had noticed. However, the reality was that not only had someone witnessed the entire event, but the pair had also killed the onlooker. The police were now investigating at the scene of the crime. Next, Jesse and the addict man took turns trying to break open the ATM with a hammer, but to no avail. It was at this moment that the little boy woke up in the room. He approached Jesse, wanting to play a game of hide-and-seek. Unexpectedly, this gave the addict woman the perfect chance to knock Jesse out. Afterwards, she took back the meth they had just handed over. After some time, Jesse regained consciousness to find the couple still trying to break into the ATM. The man was busy working underneath the machine, but the couple fell into an argument because she wanted to take her husband's share. In her rage, the woman callously pushed the ATM over, crushing her husband to death. Jesse was stunned by this turn of events, but he had the presence of mind to wipe his fingerprints from the machine. At that moment, the ATM opened by itself and money started flying out. Jesse quickly gathered the cash. Then he told the little boy they were going to play hide-and-seek, instructing him to cover his eyes. He led the child outside the house, advising him to stay put and not to go inside. Jesse didn't want the child to see his father's gruesome demise and be traumatized. Before leaving, Jesse also called the police, trusting they would arrive soon. Jesse's day had ended with a mixture of shock and relief. Early in the morning, Skyler got a call from Elliot's wife, Gretchen, who was concerned about Walter's health. All this time, Skyler had thought that Walter's medical expenses were being funded by Gretchen and her husband, so she expressed her gratitude over the phone. Gretchen realized Walter had lied to his wife, but didn't confront it over the call. Instead, she arranged to meet at Walter's house in the afternoon, hoping to clear things up. Unaware his lie was on the brink of exposure, Walter returned to teaching at school. After class, as he was preparing to take his son home, some students played a prank by sticking a missing person poster on his windshield, mocking his previous supermarket nudity incident. Walter felt helpless about it and asked his son if he knew who did it, joking that they would tie the prankster up and throw them in the desert. The son knew his father was joking, but it warmed his heart, easing the tension in their relationship. As they arrived home, Walter recognized Gretchen's car in the driveway, a bad premonition washing over him. But Gretchen, still not wanting to cause a scene in front of Skyler, confirmed Walter's lie but chose not to expose him. When Walter came back, Gretchen made an excuse and left. Later, Walter and Gretchen met at a restaurant. Walter apologized for lying, but Gretchen couldn't understand why he would rather lie than accept their help. Walter didn't want to explain further. The truth about his drug manufacturing and dealing was not an option. Faced with his dishonesty, Gretchen was displeased, but Walter was even more upset. He accused her and Elliot of betraying him after their breakup, using his research to start their company. In Walter's view, they wouldn't have their success without him. However, Gretchen insisted that it was Walter who had left them. The argument escalated until Walter lashed out, driving Gretchen away. Perhaps Walter's actions were not truly out of resentment, but rather a desire to keep others from scrutinizing him too closely and discovering his secrets. After the fallout with Gretchen, Walter returned home where Skyler informed him that Gretchen had called, saying they would no longer be funding Walter's treatment. While Skyler was disheartened, Walter breathed a sigh of relief. He explained that Gretchen and Elliot's company was having financial troubles, hinting at possible bankruptcy, which made the end of their support understandable. Skyler recalled Gretchen arriving in a luxury sports car, which didn't fit the image of bankruptcy. Walter retorted that rich people often live beyond their means. Eventually, Skyler accepted this explanation, though she was devastated. Walter reassured her that as long as they kept their spirits up, they would find more solutions than problems. After all, Gretchen and Elliot had already spent a lot on him, which was more than enough. Compared to the frequent slip-ups at the beginning, Walter was getting better at lying, not even needing to rehearse his stories anymore. To prevent his second cell phone from being discovered by his wife, Walter kept it hidden in the ceiling of his classroom. What surprised him was that Jesse hadn't been in contact for a while. It turned out that ever since witnessing the gory scene of the addict man being crushed by the ATM, Jesse had been traumatized and hadn't left his house. Left with no choice, Walter went to Jesse's house. After knocking with no answer, it was the neighbor, Jane, who emerged to flex her sexy figure. 
Upon learning that Jane was the landlady, Walter lied that he was Jesse's father, hoping she would help him open the door. As Jane hesitated, Jesse heard the noise and finally opened the door. Seeing his disheveled state, Walter was furious, and even more so when he learned of the killing. But Jesse didn't commit the murder, and he split the money he took with Walter. On the business front, Jesse was reluctant to meet with his partners until he had recovered. So Walter, under the name of Heisenberg, took charge of the meat. The trio was surprisingly well-behaved around Walter. It turns out, word had spread on the streets about Jesse's deed of smashing a dealer with an ATM, which led many debt-ridden addicts to rapidly settle their accounts. Walter was caught off guard by this development, but saw a greater business opportunity. Later, Walter approached Jesse to tell him about expanding their operation, having their associates like Skinny Pete and Combo recruit more dealers and moving into other territories. Jesse was hesitant to encroach on others' business, but Walter reassured him that he was no longer the pushover he used to be. The story of the dealer's death had spread, and no one would dare mess with him now. Despite Jesse feeling guilty over the misunderstanding, Walter emphasized that the truth didn't matter as long as people believed Jesse was responsible, giving him a fearsome reputation. Eventually, Walter's manipulation took effect. Elsewhere, Skyler was looking to supplement the family income by returning to her previous job. A pregnant woman would usually struggle to find work, but surprisingly, her old boss was very accommodating, offering her the accounting job she used to do. From their conversation, it was clear that her boss, who was divorced with twin daughters, was now a wealthy bachelor. Regardless, Skylar's employment issue was resolved. Marie was shocked to hear about Skylar's new job because her former boss had always shown more than a professional interest in Skylar. But Skylar insisted that she was only interested in the paycheck, dismissing any other implications. Although Skylar said this, her boss's true intentions remained uncertain. The next morning, Walter noticed Skylar dressed for work and realized she had returned to her former company. He didn't like to see his wife working so hard, yet he had no real reason to prevent her from doing so, especially since she felt that they were at a point where earning money was critical. Meanwhile, Hank had arrived at his new office. He used to enjoy joking around with his colleagues, but in this new setting, he was on his own. His new colleagues, accustomed to dealing with various drug lords along the border, didn't regard Hank's past accomplishments highly, possibly thinking he had just stumbled upon success. Integrating into a new circle of friends was not easy for Hank, and it was made harder since his colleagues often spoke in a foreign language, excluding him from conversations. That day, he and a colleague approached an informant for information. Hank was surprised by how differently his colleague treated the informant, considering that these informants were not to be taken lightly. The DEA agents typically treated them with courtesy. After a fruitless questioning session with the informant, Hank asked for the drug traffickers' transaction times and locations. The informant initially ignored his questions, but ultimately revealed some information about the traffickers. The DEA agents then set up an ambush at the given location, but the drug traffickers never appeared. At that moment, Hank saw through his binoculars a disturbing sight. The informant's head was moving across the ground. The team arrived at the scene to find the informant had been killed by the traffickers who had attached his head to the tortoise. Exposed informants were certain to face retribution from other traffickers. While the border DEA agents were used to such gruesome scenes, it was Hank's first encounter of this kind, and he felt nauseous. Isolated from the group, Hank's reaction led to mockery from his colleagues. Then, unexpectedly, the tortoise with the head on it exploded, injuring and possibly killing the agents while Hank narrowly avoided the blast. It was a stark reminder of how dangerous the drug lords on the border were and how one misstep could prove fatal. On the other side, Jesse finally overcame his trauma and made a full recovery. He met with his team and instructed them to start recruiting sub-dealers, marking the first step in expanding their operation. However, Walter felt this was still not enough. They were underpricing their product, and he planned to raise the prices once they had monopolized the drug market. Jesse, not understanding economic principles, simply listened and did not offer his opinion. Afterward, Jesse stepped out from his room and saw Jane painting in front of the door. It turned out she was a tattoo artist, which was a shared interest with Jesse, who also enjoyed painting. This finally gave them a common topic to talk about. As Jesse struck up a conversation, a man on a motorcycle appeared. He recognized Jesse as the big shot currently being discussed in the drug world and showered him with flattery. However, this also made Jane realize that Jesse was no ordinary person. Later, Jesse confessed his real name and admitted that he and Walter were not actually father and son, promising not to engage in any bad deeds at home. To ease the awkward atmosphere, Jesse invited Jane to watch TV at his place. 
Unfortunately, the new television set just wouldn't work properly, showing no signal and leaving them sitting in front of a blue screen. Trying to lighten the mood, Jesse told Jane not to worry, but the TV wouldn't cooperate. Just when Jesse was at a loss for words, Jane took the initiative to hold Jesse's hand, signaling that they had developed smelly feelings for each other. After watching the blue screen for a while, they fell into a hormone yoga session. Afterward, Jane revealed she had been sober for 18 months. Hearing this, Jesse claimed he only indulged occasionally and was not a heavy addict. Despite their seemingly different worlds, the two found they had quite a lot in common. On Saturday, Walter wanted Skylar to rest well at home, but she insisted on going to the company to work overtime for double pay. He was uncomfortable with her wearing a low-cut dress, thinking it was too revealing. Right after Skylar left, Walter received a call from Marie, who informed him that her husband Hank had returned and wasn't in good spirits. Concerned, Walter decided to visit, only to learn about Hank's harrowing experience at the border. Hank, suffering from panic attacks, had shut himself in his room and refused to see even Marie. However, when he saw Walter enter, he sat up from the bed, clearly afraid of appearing weak. Walter tried to encourage him to face his fears, understanding Hank's situation better than anyone. Ever since he embarked on the path of drug manufacturing, Walter had been living under the constant threat of death. He told Hank that he had always lived cautiously, but after being diagnosed with cancer, he expected to break down completely. Instead, he became more indifferent. Walter hoped Hank wouldn't avoid reality and accept the truth. Hank had always thought Walter was just a meek high school teacher, but today's conversation made him see Walter in a new light. Under Walter's persuasion, Hank perked up and returned to his workstation. In front of his colleagues, he still cracked jokes and laughed, feigning strength. Since expanding the business, Jesse and Walter's enterprise had flourished, earning so much money that they even resorted to using a cash counter. Amidst the celebration, bad news arrived. Badger was arrested by the police during a sale. The whole story wasn't clear at first. Earlier, Badger was sitting on a street bench when a thin man approached him, asking to buy drugs. Though Badger didn't trust him easily, fearing he might be an undercover cop, he still couldn't escape the man's ploys and ended up getting caught with the goods. Over at the police station, the thin officer was recording Badger's statement, hoping he would snitch on the big-time drug lord supplying him. Luckily, Badger kept his honor and didn't betray Jesse and Walter. Just then, a lawyer named Saul entered the interrogation room and quickly dismissed the police, claiming he wanted to have a serious talk with his client. However, Badger had never hired him. Saul had taken the initiative to drum up business. Saul was actually a formidable street lawyer with strong professional ethics, always managing to employ various underhand methods to win his clients' cases. Saul assured Badger that with the right payment, he could guarantee an acquittal. Upon learning about Saul, Walter remained skeptical. Pretending to be Badger's uncle, he visited the law firm to ask about the situation. Saul was overflowing with confidence about the upcoming case. He had learned that the police's real target was the drug lord Heisenberg. If he could just get Badger to divulge information on Heisenberg, it would be smooth sailing. This revelation shocked Walter since Saul had no idea that he was actually speaking to Heisenberg himself. Walter quickly devised a plan, offering 10,000 to Saul on the condition that he could free Badger without exposing Heisenberg. Unexpectedly, the usually money-loving Saul turned down Walter's bribe. With no alternatives left, they had to resort to some drastic measures. In the evening, Walter and Jesse, wearing masks, lurked near the law firm waiting for Saul, the last to leave work. As soon as he appeared, they abducted him to a desolate rural area. Jesse bluntly stated that he should have taken the $10,000 during the day. Saul's reason for refusing was to avoid unnecessary trouble. He never accepted bribes from strangers. Jesse demanded that Saul secure Badger's release without him snitching on Heisenberg. If Saul didn't agree, they were ready to bury him alive right there. At that moment, Walter couldn't help but cough, and Saul instantly recognized him. With the situation at a head, Walter no longer hid his identity, taking off his mask to breathe the fresh air. Under the threats, Saul finally agreed to their demands. However, he couldn't guarantee that Badger wouldn't ever snitch, and he also wondered why they didn't bribe someone in the prison to eliminate Badger, thus preventing future threats. Others might have done so, but Jesse was not that kind of person. Badger was not only a business partner, but also a brother. The next day at the DEA, the police continued to interrogate Badger with Saul present. Finally, Badger described Heisenberg as a bald, middle-aged man. In fact, this was another one of Saul's tricks. The police hoped Badger would arrange a meeting with Heisenberg while they lay in wait to arrest him. 
Of course, the person meeting Badger wouldn't be Walter, but a convict, a peculiar man who had served 44 years in prison. Amazingly, prison had become his career. As long as someone paid, he was willing to take the blame and serve the time. For the plan to go smoothly, Walter and his crew needed to pay $80,000, $50,000 to Saul and $30,000 to the convict. And so the money they had worked hard to earn was nearly spent. The following day, under police surveillance, Badger went to the same street bench intending to meet the fake Heisenberg. However, there was a bug in Saul's plan. Badger didn't know what the convict looked like. By a stroke of bad luck, a bald bystander accidentally got involved. Just as the plan was about to fall through, Walter, observing from a distance, quickly acted with a stroke of genius. He drove to Hank's location, pretended to have a casual encounter, and used the car to block Hank's line of sight. Meanwhile, Jesse took the opportunity to approach Badger and remind him that this was not the convict. After a close call, Badger finally met with the real convict, and everything went smoothly. When the police appeared, the convict professionally surrendered by kneeling on the ground. The narcotics officers were thrilled to catch Heisenberg, but Hank was filled with doubt, feeling that the arrest had gone suspiciously too smoothly. In class, Walter was grading student assignments when unexpectedly, Saul took the initiative to come to him. Utilizing a private detective, Saul could effortlessly track Walter's movements and had even learned Heisenberg's true identity. Saul wanted to join forces with Walter, and although he was motivated by profit, for Walter, having a lawyer might be necessary. Inevitably, there would be future dealings with narcotics officers, and having a professional by his side would make things easier. Moreover, figuring out how to launder the drug money was crucial. Previously, Walter simply stashed the cash at home, which was never going to be a long-term solution. Before leaving, Saul dropped a hint. If they want to make more money and keep it, remember to come to him. Afterward, the family accompanied Walter to the hospital for a checkup, but the results wouldn't be available for a week. However, right after the examination, Walter caught a glimpse of the scan reflection in the mirror, revealing a large white shadow in his lung. He was in fear that the cancer had spread further. Walter went to Saul's office to discuss money laundering. He had already spent 80000 on Badger's case and now only had 16000 left. After laundering, the amount that would end up in Walter's hands would be significantly less, just 10000 Considering his health, Walter had prepared for the worst. Right now, what he wanted most was to work overtime producing drugs. Unlike Walter's anxiety, Jesse was recently lost in love, enjoying a blissful world for two with Jane. One day, Walter called Jesse to clear his schedule for four days as they needed to head to the countryside to buckle down and work on their venture. Initially, Jesse was reluctant because he had already made plans to go to the museum with Jane. Walter didn't care about that and lied, claiming that if they didn't get back to serious work, the methamphetamine they had gone to great lengths to obtain would expire. Hearing this, Jesse reluctantly agreed. But for Walter to peacefully cook, he needed an excuse to leave home. He tricked his wife by saying he was going to visit his mother, hinting that if he suddenly passed away, he would never have another chance. Seeing Walter so pessimistic, Skylar comforted him, suggesting that the checkup results might come back without issues. Afterwards, Skylar drove Walter to the station. Walter lingered in the station for a while before Jesse appeared in an RV. The two arrived at a deserted countryside spot. As soon as they got there, Jesse wanted to call his sweetheart Jane to ease his longing, but there was no cell signal. Noticing that Walter's phone still had one bar, he asked to borrow it but was flatly refused. When Jesse casually tossed the car keys onto a table, Walter couldn't help but nag, telling him to put them somewhere they wouldn't be in the way. Without thinking, Jesse plugged the keys into the RV's ignition. Next, they both dedicated themselves wholeheartedly to drug production, working in shifts to maximize efficiency, tirelessly day and night. After two days, they produced 42 pounds of the product. If all sold, each would earn more than 600,000. Hearing this number, both Walter and Jesse were overjoyed. However, the joy lasted only a few seconds. When they were ready to leave, they discovered the RV's battery was dead. Jesse then realized that he had left the keys in the ignition two days prior, inadvertently draining the battery. Although Walter was nearly livid, he quickly looked for solutions. Luckily, they had a generator in the car. All they needed to do was charge the battery. Without a word, Walter siphoned gas from the car with his mouth and had Jesse pour it into the generator. But Jesse was careless, spilling gasoline everywhere. After much hassle, the generator exploded. There was no time to be angry. Walter turned to get a fire extinguisher from the car, but to his surprise, Jesse used water to put out the fire, meaning well, but doing harm. The fire was out, but the generator was destroyed. And just like that, the two were stranded in the wilderness.
Jesse climbed onto the roof of the vehicle, hoping that by doing so, his cell phone would regain a signal. That way, he could call for help. But luck wasn't on his side, and he was forced to ask Walter to borrow his phone again. Previously, Walter had refused to lend his phone because he was worried Skyler would notice unusual charges on the bill. But in this situation, there seemed to be no better option. They couldn't just stay trapped there. The problems would only become more severe. So Jesse borrowed Walter's phone to call Skinny Pete for help. After giving him the directions, he urged him to set off immediately. Due to the distance, Jesse and Walter waited in the wilderness until nightfall, but Skinny Pete didn't show up. Considering the significant temperature drop from day to night, they had to endure the cold. When Jesse finally got through to Skinny Pete again, he found out the guy had taken the wrong road. Jesse tried to give Skinny Pete further instructions, but just then, the phone's battery died, shutting down automatically. It seemed they couldn't count on outside help. With that, the two of them spent a difficult night in the wilderness. As soon as dawn broke, Walter, pushing through his physical limits, started to hand crank the generator. In theory, this primitive method could charge the battery, but it was incredibly draining and time-consuming. They had to take turns. After a night of struggle, Walter was completely exhausted and fell asleep in his chair. Jesse called out to him several times without getting a response, and for a moment thought he had passed away. Jesse didn't know how long he had been turning the crank when he tried to start the vehicle, but it was still a no-go. This left him on the verge of a breakdown, even regretting coming out with Walter. Feeling dejected, Jesse went to check on Walter and discovered he was coughing up fresh blood. It dawned on Jesse that the methamphetamine expiring was a lie. Walter was rushing for profit because his condition had worsened. While resting in the vehicle, Walter also began to reflect on his life. Since his cancer diagnosis, the lies he told to make money from drug production had snowballed, deceiving his family and Jesse. Each time he thought about it, it pained his heart. Jesse didn't want to die there and expressed his determination to walk out if necessary. But Walter quickly dampened his spirits, pointing out that they were both hungry and thirsty, already dehydrated, and trying to walk out could kill them in less than an hour. This made Jesse even more irritable, and he snapped back at Walter. Although Jesse's words sounded absurd, they gave Walter an idea. Since the generator was broken, he thought of making a battery. No sooner said than done, he instructed Jesse to gather all the coins he had on him and to find anything made of pure zinc or galvanized material in the car, along with a brake pad. Jesse complied obediently. Quickly, Walter fashioned six batteries to form a battery pack. This is their last chance to get out of the wilderness. Walter inserted the car key into the ignition. This time, it finally started. The two drove to the station. Jesse, after seeing something was on Walter's mind, promised that if anything serious happened to him, he would make sure all the money earned from selling drugs would be handed over to Skyler. With Jesse's word, Walter was finally able to relax. In the blink of an eye, a week passed. Walter and his family came back to the hospital to hear the doctor's verdict. The doctor had expected the tumor to shrink by about a quarter after treatment, but to everyone's amazement, it shrank by 80%. It seemed that not only had Walter's condition not worsened, but it had significantly improved. It turns out the white shadows on the previous scan was just pneumonia, and Walter coughing up blood in the wilderness was due to a tear in his esophagus caused by coughing. Upon hearing the good news, Walter and his family wept with joy. Although the disease was under control, they still had to continue treatment and not take it lightly. Afterward, Walter went to the restroom and fiercely punched the metal tissue box until his hands bled. The psychological pressure of being shrouded in death the past week was unimaginable. Venting his emotions in such an extreme way was totally understandable. Since their last farewell at the station, Walter and Jesse hadn't seen each other for some time. This day, they met in a restaurant, and Jesse was genuinely happy to hear of Walter's improved condition. It was clear that although they started out as just partners, often at odds, they had grown through their time together to be more than just collaborators. They were like mentor and student or friends. Afterwards, Jesse handed over the drug money to Walter and inquired about the next steps. Walter expressed a wish to retire from the game once the remaining stock was sold off. Although Jesse was surprised by this decision, he respected Walter's wishes. To celebrate Walter's recovery, Skyler hosted a party at home over the weekend. As usual, Walter didn't stand out much. Everyone gathered around Skyler, listening to her recount the journey the family had taken during Walter's fight against cancer. She also made a special point of thanking Gretchen and her husband for their support. Hearing this made Walter feel disgruntled. It was his money, earned from risk, yet the credit was going to others. When it was Walter's turn to speak, his reflection left people puzzled. He wondered why he had been made ill and why he had been allowed to recover. 
Others were lost in his words, unsure how to respond. In truth, Walter's speech was revealing his guilt. Making drugs had been an act of desperation. Now that his illness was under control and he looked back on his past actions, his conscience was bound to hurt. Afterward, Walter and his son joined Hank by the pool for a drink. Agent Hank always loved to show off and began to regale the boy with his drug enforcement stories. Watching his son's face light up with admiration, Walter probably cursed Hank silently. Hank was so scared after coming back from the border that he hid in his room. He would panic at the slightest thing and now put on an act in front of the child, and his bragging revealed the darker aspects of Walter's personality. Walter was no longer the simple high school teacher. He was also the formidable drug lord Heisenberg. In front of Hank, Walter even took the initiative to pour drinks for his son. Initially, Hank didn't mind, considering it a celebration, but Walter didn't seem to know when to stop. Finally, Hank couldn't stand it anymore and took the bottle away. However, after three drinks, Walter showed no respect for Hank, declaring that this was his house, the alcohol and his son were his, meaning Hank had no say. Hank was stunned and could only cover his embarrassment with a smile. Just then, the boy, unable to hold his liquor, felt sick and knelt by the poolside, vomiting. Hearing the noise, Skylar came over, and that's how the commotion ended. The next morning, Walter woke up and realized he had been inappropriate at the party the night before. He quickly phoned Skylar, who was at work and still upset, refusing to answer. To make amends, Walter decided to do something for the family. The first thing on his mind was the long, broken water heater. He went to the store to buy a new one, and the clerk recommended a cost-effective model. But having money to spend, Walter insisted that cost was not an issue and ended up buying the most advanced and newest water heater. While paying, Walter noticed a blood-stained bill among his wads of cash. He slipped it into his pocket when the clerk looked away. Meanwhile, Jesse had been busy dating Jane, even sharing his childhood sketchbooks with her. Life seemed perfect until Jane's father made a surprise visit. Jesse was excited, expecting a proper introduction. Instead, Jane coldly referred to him as a tenant. Jesse was heartbroken, thinking that he was nothing more than Jane's backup plan. Later, Jane explained that her father was a strict man and would disapprove of their relationship if he knew Jesse was not seriously employed. Jesse was even angrier, not expecting Jane to belittle him. Perhaps realizing her words had hurt Jesse's pride, it wasn't long before Jane tried to make amends. Indeed, Jesse was quite easy to console. Walter installed the new water heater himself. His son was delighted to see this. Addressing the issue of being pushed to drink at the party, Walter sincerely apologized to his son. However, the boy didn't blame him at all. Instead, he felt it was his own fault for getting sick in the pool. Hearing his words, Walter felt even more remorseful and decided to replace the moldy floor in the house as well. So he bought some flooring and threw himself into this new project with all his energy. But Walter was unaware of the subtle changes in the relationship between Skylar and her boss. Lately, Skylar had been working late. She also discovered discrepancies in the company's accounts. After the boss was informed, he told her not to worry too much, assuring her there were no major issues with the accounts. As they talked, perhaps Skylar thought of her husband's behavior at the party and couldn't help but start crying like a giant baby. The boss took her hand to comfort her using both words and muscles, clearly still harboring feelings for her. Skylar pulled her hand away and reached for a tissue to wipe her crocodile tears. At first, it seemed she thought the gesture was inappropriate, but after drying her eyes, she reached out and took his hand again. These days, Walter was absorbed in fixing the floor, so much so that he didn't even have time for breakfast. On one hand, he was trying to make up for his mistake. On the other, he was simply not accustomed to having nothing to do. Seeing Walter busy as a bee, Skylar didn't appreciate his effort, instead finding his behavior strange. One evening, Walter went to the mall to buy paint, where a shopping cart caught his attention. The items inside were the materials Walter used to make drugs. However, the person with the cart was clearly a novice in drug making, having even picked the wrong type of a crucial ingredient. As an expert, Walter couldn't resist giving some advice. The novice was so frightened upon realizing he was dealing with a pro that he abandoned his cart and ran away. Walter thought something was amiss and followed him, only to see the novice meet up with a bald man beside a car, the same model as Jesse's. Walter felt it was still okay for the man to copy his hairstyle, but it's unacceptable that they imitate his drug production method. Walter approached them and told the bald man to get lost with his bald head. Intimidated by his powerful presence, they drove away hastily. It's clear that although Walter keeps saying he wants to quit the drug business, his every action betrays him. Perhaps his initial intention was to save up some money, but drug making had become a part of his life without him realizing it. It's not something he can just walk away from. 
The scene shifts to Combo, standing on the street corner as usual, selling products to clients when a car pulled up beside him. The two men inside looked like bad news. At first, Combo thought they were customers, but they just stared at him for a few seconds and left. These men didn't go far, though. They sneakily hid around a corner, keeping a watchful eye on him. Sensing something was off, Combo hurriedly made a call for help to Skinny Pete, but it didn't go through, so he left a message with his current location, indicating he was being followed. At this moment, Combo failed to notice a young boy on a bicycle nearby. Just after hanging up the phone, he was shot. The shooter was none other than the little boy. Combo tried to escape, but the boy fired several more shots and ultimately, Combo lay in a pool of his own blood. On Walter's end, Skyler was accompanying him to a hospital checkup, still unaware of Combo's fate. The doctor told Walter that although his condition was temporarily stable, it was only a matter of time before the cancerous tissue spread if not removed. When Skyler heard the surgery would cost around 200000 she was stunned. Walter insisted on having the surgery, acting as if the cost was of no concern. Walter wasn't worried about the finances, which made complete sense. However, Skyler, who knew nothing of Walter's new venture, was utterly bewildered, wondering where her husband was getting his confidence from. The surgery was initially scheduled for two weeks later, but it coincided with Skyler's due date. Not wanting to miss the birth of his daughter, Walter negotiated with the doctor to postpone the surgery for four weeks. Back at school, Walter uses a second phone to call Jesse to check on the progress of their drug sales, only to find out that Combo had been gunned down by some unknown assailants. Awkwardly, Walter had never paid much attention to his underlings and didn't even know who Combo was, which infuriated Jesse enough to hang up on him. Unsurprisingly, Combo had become a casualty in a turf war. Jesse had no leads on the killer. There were no witnesses at the crime scene. All he knew was that Combo had called Skinny Pete just before he died, saying he was being watched. Clearly, this was related to Walter's recent aggressive expansion, which had encroached on the territory of other dealers, leading to Combo's untimely end. To make matters worse, Jesse's reputation was now in tatters. It had become known that the story about him killing a dealer with an ATM machine was a lie. Their once promising distribution network had crumbled overnight, and Jesse and Walter's business had plummeted from its peak. With their meth stockpile still on hand, they were at a loss as to how to sell it. Desperate, the two sought help from the lawyer Saul. After learning the full story, Saul couldn't help but mock them, saying they were amateur drug dealers who had been lucky to get as far as they had. While Walter and Jesse were distraught, Saul seemed unfazed. When he found out they still had 38 pounds of product, he was shocked. They were sitting on a gold mine and had nothing to fear. Saul's confidence stemmed from having a plan. He told them he could introduce them to a professional who had been in the drug distribution business for 20 years and had never been caught. This person only dealt in wholesale and treated the drug business like any high-profit commodity trade. He was a major player in the drug world, but his style was more that of a businessman, in stark contrast to Tuco's bloody approach. In short, he was a big shot, but like Walter, he kept a low profile. Even the well-connected Saul didn't know his real name. Early the next morning, Walter arrived at a fried chicken joint, ready to meet with the big shot. Jesse showed up looking exhausted and late. Walter was only concerned with moving the product and didn't even mention the death of Combo, which really rubbed Jesse the wrong way. He didn't stay long before storming off angrily. Walter waited for the mysterious big shot who never showed up and eventually had to leave for the hospital since it was also the day of his wife's prenatal checkup. Surprisingly, Skyler didn't reprimand Walter for being late and seemed to be in a good mood. After the checkup, she went straight to the office to celebrate her boss's birthday. At the party, their flirtatious behavior in front of colleagues was so evident that anyone who didn't know better might think they were a couple. Meanwhile, Walter received a call from Saul, informing him that the big shot had been at the chicken shop but refused to work with him. However, Walter wasn't one to give up easily. He returned to the chicken shop and waited until nightfall, but the big shot still didn't show. Walter realized that the only person who had been paying attention to him all day was the owner of the chicken shop, Uncle Chicken. After a conversation, Uncle Chicken revealed his identity and explained his refusal to work with Walter was related to Jesse's drug use and tardiness. Uncle Chicken questioned Walter's judgment, wondering why he would choose someone like Jesse. In his defense, Walter explained that despite Jesse's clumsiness, he was still a trustworthy person. Walter tried to persuade Uncle Chicken to change his mind, touting the high quality of his meth and the market demand. He argued that even if he raised the price, addicts would still flock to it. 
Uncle Chicken didn't give a response, only saying they would be in touch later, and before leaving, he advised Walter never to trust an addict. On Skylar's end, she discovered her boss had been cooking the books and committing tax fraud involving a million dollars, but Skylar couldn't bring herself to expose her boss. She didn't want to be entangled in it and thought about quitting her job, but she couldn't drive far before turning back, obviously unable to leave her boss's situation alone. Meanwhile, since the falling out with Walter, Jesse had been hiding at home. When Jane visited him, she brought along some substances for them to enjoy together. Walter finally received a message from Uncle Chicken and excitedly headed to the fried chicken shop, only to find that no one was there to meet him. It was from the staff that he learned Uncle Chicken was the elusive owner of a 14-store fried chicken chain who randomly visited any of his locations. Walter fretted over whether he would have to search each store one by one. In his moment of impatience, a stranger approached him, revealing the meeting place and stating that Uncle Chicken was willing to pay $1.2 million in cash to buy all the meth Walter had. However, the catch was that the deal had to happen within an hour. It was a now-or-never situation. Time was of the essence. Walter had to hurriedly contact Jesse since all the product was with him, but frustratingly, calls were going unanswered. It seemed Uncle Chicken was right. He really can't rely on someone who uses drugs. With no other choice, Walter dashed to Jesse's place and had to break in. Inside, he found Jesse and Jane passed out. In desperation to wake Jesse, Walter resorted to splashing water and slapping him. After some effort, he managed to find out where the stash was hidden. As he rummaged through the kitchen, a text from Skylar popped up. His daughter was coming early. The timing couldn't be worse. Walter was torn between family and the chance to make a significant amount of money. After wrestling with his conscience, he decided to complete the deal first. As for Skylar, he would have to make it up to her later. Rushing to the meeting point with the meth, Walter managed to make the sale, but arrived at the hospital too late. Skylar had safely given birth to their daughter with her boss by her side. Skylar wasn't angry about his absence, which was bittersweet for Walter. It suggested her feelings for him might be fading. Later, Walter excused himself to go home under the pretense of fetching a change of clothes, but his real intention was to hide the 1.2 million. The next morning, Jesse and Jane were still in bed when Jane's father called, reminding her not to forget the rehab session they had planned. At the event, Jane was restless, and when her father asked if she was dating Jesse, she vehemently denied it. Meanwhile, Jesse had finally sobered up and discovered a huge hole in his door with no memory of Walter's visit. Seeing the stash gone from the kitchen, he assumed a thief had stolen all the meth. In panic, he called Walter to report the burglary, oblivious to the fact that he had been the one visited. Adding to Jesse's confusion, Walter felt that Jesse's mistakes were the reason he missed the birth of his daughter. As a form of punishment, Walter simply hung up the phone, leaving Jesse to his paranoia. At night, Walter hosted a family party at his home to celebrate the birth of his daughter. Hank even specially ordered fried chicken. Looking at the takeout bag, Walter found it familiar. It was from Uncle Chicken's place. Hank, the DEA agent, would never have guessed that he was so close to two major drug lords. Considering the expenses for his daughter and Walter's upcoming surgery, Skyler was eager to get back to work. Even though Walter was on the verge of joining the Millionaire's Club, he couldn't breathe a word of it to his family. It must have been very frustrating. At most, he could only wait until his family was asleep to let his young daughter look at the wads of cash he had earned. The next day, Jesse was visibly upset and confronted Walter at school. He had seen the message Walter left him before the transaction and knew the truth, accusing Walter of deceiving him. At this, Walter became even angrier. As a drug dealer, Jesse should be ready at all times. Of the $1.2 million earned, Saul would take a $240,000 cut, leaving the remaining to be split between Walter and Jesse. However, considering Jesse's recent behavior, Walter had no immediate plans to give him his share. He worried that Jesse would only get worse with money and eventually kill himself. Seeing this, Jesse quickly promised to stop using drugs. But mere words were no longer convincing. It would take Jesse buying drug testing kits from the pharmacy to prove his sobriety. Realizing Walter was serious, Jesse knew he wouldn't get the money anytime soon and left in anger. Back home, Skylar had good news. To help ease the family's financial burden, their son had quietly set up a crowdfunding site for Walter. Seeing his photo on the webpage, Walter had mixed feelings. He knew his son did nothing wrong, but his damned pride was getting in the way. Walter couldn't accept this overt act of begging. While he had made quite a bit of money, he couldn't use it openly. This was too frustrating. In a gloomy mood, he went to Saul for advice and ended up inspired. 
Saul told him that crowdfunding was a good thing. It would allow a hacker to break down the drug money into small amounts and funnel it back into Walter's donation account. This way, the money would be successfully laundered. Hearing this, Walter finally felt a bit better. After being turned away by Walter, Jesse returned home to meet Jane. Shocked to learn that Walter owed Jesse $480,000, Jane convinced him to reclaim the money. Due to their substance abuse, Jane missed her rehab meeting the following day. Her father arrived to find her entangled with drug addict Jesse. Enraged, he dragged Jesse to the floor. Frightened, Jesse armed himself with a baseball bat. Heartbroken by his daughter's regression, her father threatened to disown her and have her arrested. But moved by Jane's pleas and her vow to get clean, he softened and backed down. However, Jane had no intention of quitting drugs, especially with Jesse's substantial sum. To access the funds and escape her father's control, she even threatened Walter over the phone to hand over the money or face exposure. Jesse was reluctant but swayed. That evening, Walter lied about buying diapers and visited Jesse's home with the money. Guilty, Jesse avoided eye contact and before Walter could advise him further, Jane emotionlessly shut the door. Later at a bar, Walter found himself next to Jane's distressed father. They shared their troubles, relating over Jane and Jesse. Walter complained about his disobedient nephew, Jesse, and Jane's father imparted that family should never be abandoned, inspiring Walter to act. He returned to find Jesse and Jane unconscious. Intending to wake Jesse, he unintentionally turned Jane onto her back, causing her to begin vomiting, risking suffocation. Walter contemplated helping but hesitated, knowing Jane's influence over Jesse and the threat she posed with her knowledge. Ultimately, Walter watched as Jane choked, tormented by the decision but seeing no alternative. Afterward, Jesse woke up to find Jane stone cold. He tried desperately to revive his girlfriend, but it was too late. Unable to accept Jane's sudden death and on the verge of a breakdown, Jesse didn't know what to do and resorted to calling Walter for help. Walter had a plan ready and reassured Jesse not to panic, promising to handle the situation. Soon after, Saul sent an old trouble fixer to Jesse's place, who looked highly professional and capable. The trouble fixer quickly cleaned up the crime scene and coached Jesse on how to call the police and respond to their questions flawlessly. But Jesse, still immersed in the grief of losing his beloved, might not have absorbed the instructions. Just to be sure, the trouble fixer slapped Jesse sharply, forcing him to repeat the instructions out loud. Through tears, Jesse managed to rehearse his lines for the police. After everything was explained, the trouble fixer took the bags containing the drug money and substances and left. Jane's father, planning to take her to rehab as promised, arrived only to see an ambulance at the door. When he saw Jane again, she was nothing but a cold corpse. Her sudden death left her father heartbroken, too devastated to even be angry at Jesse. When questioned by the police, Jesse stuck to the trouble fixer's script, claiming he woke up to find Jane dead and knew nothing else. Under these circumstances, the police are likely to rule the death as an accidental overdose. Walter's side of things was buzzing with excitement. It turns out, kind-hearted people had already started donating money. Although the amounts were small, they gave the family a glimmer of hope. Only Walter knew that it was Saul who paid a hacker to boost the fund. This money didn't need to be repaid. It was theirs to keep. Regardless, Walter finally saw his drug money being legitimized. As the crowdfunding total rose, Skyler and their son were overjoyed. But Walter was worried, especially about Jesse's well-being. By now, he had come to see Jesse as his own son. With the trouble fixer's help, Walter arrived at a rundown, abandoned factory. It pained him to think Jesse was spiraling in such a place, trying to numb the pain of losing his love. It took considerable effort, but Walter found Jesse and called him son. Hearing Walter's fatherly tone, Jesse couldn't hold back anymore and broke down crying in his arms, releasing all the pent-up emotions he had been carrying. The guilt and sorrow were crushing him. He felt responsible for Jane's death. Seeing Jesse in such despair broke Walter's heart, but now they had to face reality. Walter took Jesse to a rehab center, hoping he'd heal and kick the habit. Walter told him he wouldn't be able to visit for a while because he was undergoing surgery and his fate was uncertain. If anything happened to him, Jesse was to go to Saul, where the trouble fixer had taken the money. Over at the DEA, Hank organized a fundraiser for Walter. Colleagues donated generously. Then Hank pulled out Combo's photo. Normally, Combo wouldn't have caught Hank's attention, but the blue meth he dealt in did. It confirmed Hank's suspicion that the Heisenberg they had caught was a fake. He also discovered that this blue meth had become a hot commodity for addicts across various states. It seemed Uncle Chicken had indeed made a name for himself, distributing the blue meth throughout the country. On that day, three big businessmen were due to visit the DEA for an investment survey, and Uncle Chicken was among them. 
He used his businessman cover to easily gather intel from the precinct, a clever move. When Uncle Chicken saw Walter's photo on the donation box, he learned about his cancer and also about Walter's relation to Hank. Walter returned home to a shocking scene. A group of reporters had set up their equipment, ready to interview him and his family. Everyone was dressed formally except for him. It turned out that Marie had told a patient who worked at the newspaper about the crowdfunding efforts leading to this media circus. Walter knew all too well where the website's money came from and believed it was best kept to a minimum of people. Now, not only was it becoming widely known, but he'd also have to make a public appearance on TV. The situation infuriated Walter. The day of the surgery finally arrived. Walter lay in bed while Skyler removed any unnecessary items from his person, casually asking if he still had his phone on him. Due to the anesthetic, Walter's mind was foggy, and he confusedly asked her which phone she meant. Skyler had always been troubled about the second phone, but until now, it had only been a suspicion without proof. However, this wasn't the time to settle that matter. Fortunately, Walter's surgery went smoothly, and his recovery was looking good. After some time, Walter went back to the hospital for a follow-up visit. Skyler's main concern was when Walter could start living independently without relying on anyone. The doctor's response was that Walter was capable of doing so now. When they got back home, Skyler began packing their things to spend the weekend at Marie's house with their daughter and told Walter he had two days to move out. Walter was stunned and didn't understand what had happened. It was then that Skyler finally made her revelation. During Walter's recovery period, she had secretly done some digging and found out that Gretchen hadn't contributed a single penny from start to finish. So where had Walter's medical expenses come from? Additionally, she had called her mother-in-law and discovered that Walter had never visited her. The old lady was even unaware of her son's illness. All the lies were exposed, and Walter was at a loss for words. He could only plead with Skyler to stay and give him a chance to tell the truth. But a series of lies had already driven Skyler to despair, and she left home with her daughter. Ever since the loss of his daughter, Jane's father had been suppressing his pain. He tried to perform his job as an air traffic controller well, but he became distracted upon seeing a plane named Jane. Ultimately, due to his error, two planes collided in the air. The wreckage scattered, and by a cruel twist of fate, one piece fell right into Walter's swimming pool, accompanied by a pink teddy bear. If Walter knew that this accident was caused by Jane's father, one could only wonder what he would feel, especially knowing that the root cause was Jane's death, a tragedy that Walter's inaction had set into motion. This is Daniel CC Movie Channel. Stay safe and enjoy your day.